Welcome to this three-part demo video series on Live Volume with Auto Failover for Microsoft. While Live Volume is an optional feature that has been available with the Dell SE Series Storage for many years, Auto Failover is a recent feature enhancement to Live Volume that first became available with the Storage Center Operating System version 6.7 and the feature was initially supported in VMware environments only. With the release of SCOS version 7.1, we are pleased to announce that Auto Failover support has now been extended to Microsoft environments in addition to VMware. In part 1 of 3, for those that might be less familiar with Live Volume, we'll start off by providing an overview of some of the core Live Volume features including load balancing, disaster avoidance, support for synchronous replication, preserve Live Volume, and managed replication. Next, we'll review how Live Volume works with single and multiple hosts, how to configure automatic Live Volume role swapping, and explain the difference between uniform and non-uniform server mappings. In part 2 of 3, we'll introduce the Live Volume with Auto Failover Feature Enhancement, now extended to support Microsoft environments, including a deep dive into how the feature works given some common disaster recovery scenarios. In part 3, we'll show how Live Volume with Auto Failover for Microsoft works in a live lab environment. For part one of three, let's start off by reviewing some of the core features and functionality of Live Volume. As stated in the introduction, Live Volume is an optional feature with Dell SE Series Storage that has been available for many years. One of the main reasons for its development initially was to provide a way for administrators to load balance their storage centers. As shown here, over time, an existing storage center may start to reach its storage or performance capacity. Live Volume makes it quick and easy to move workloads to other storage centers by moving the associated volumes. Simply add a new storage center to the environment, identify a volume to be moved, convert it from a regular volume to a live volume, and allow the data to fully replicate to the target storage center. This can be done while the volume is live and serving I.O. without impacting the workload and then perform a manual role swap to promote the secondary live volume on the target storage center to primary status. If utilizing synchronous replication, the swapping can be done with no downtime while the workload is live. If using asynchronous replication, such as would be necessary if there were bandwidth or latency limitations between the two storage centers, then the workload might need to incur a brief outage during a maintenance window to ensure that all of the data is fully replicated to the target storage center before swapping roles. After the role swap, the storage admin has several options. Leave the live volume configuration in place with replication back to the original or a different storage center. Remove the live volume pairing and retain standard volume replication only. Or Discontinue the live volume pair and replication altogether so that there is no longer any association with the original storage center. Another core feature is the ability to use live volume to move critical workloads to another location given a disaster avoidance situation. Disaster avoidance means being able to plan for and gracefully move critical workloads to another location in advance of a future event that will cause downtime at the primary location such as a planned power outage, routine maintenance, or even natural occurrences such as an approaching hurricane. In this example, a storage center in Minneapolis needs to be taken offline for planned maintenance. Before the start of the maintenance window, an administrator moves a critical workload to another location in St. Paul by performing a live volume roll swap. With the critical workload now running from the alternate location, Plan maintenance can now be performed at the primary location while the critical workload continues operation. Once the maintenance has been performed and the primary site comes back online, the primary live volume role can then be swapped back to the original location. This live volume functionality allows administrators great flexibility with business continuity planning by allowing them to gracefully move critical workloads and keep them running at alternate locations as long as it is necessary. With the release of SCOS 6.5 and 6.6, Live Volume was enhanced to include full support for synchronous replication, including both high availability and high consistency modes. Administrators can even change between any of the replication types on the fly with a few clicks 
choosing between asynchronous and both types of synchronous replication while the workload is live and serving I.O. without causing any downtime or service interruption and without having to destroy or recreate the live volume pair or take it offline. Along with support for synchronous replication in SCOS 6.5 and 6.6 .6 came two additional feature enhancements. The first of these is the ability for an administrator to promote a secondary live volume to primary without having to contact Dell support given a disaster that takes the primary site offline unexpectedly. This ability to recover a secondary live volume and promote it to primary is known as preserve live volume. After performing a preserve live volume operation, once the primary site comes back online again, the storage center ensures that the original primary live volume does not come back online as primary. This prevents an undesirable split brain situation where data might otherwise be written to both live volumes at the same time, causing data inconsistencies or corruption. Instead, it is brought back online as a secondary live volume. The other live volume enhancement that came with Storage Center OS 6.5 and 6.6 .6 is the ability to add a follow-on replication known as a managed replication to an additional site to provide enhanced DR protection. With this follow-on replication, administrators can leverage the Dell Storage Manager to create predefined disaster recovery plans to recover critical workloads at a DR site should an unplanned event take down both the primary and secondary live volumes at the same time, as shown here. The managed replication will even follow the primary live volume automatically to the other storage center if a role swap occurs for any reason. Given a disaster that affects the primary location, administrators can recover a critical workload at the DR site using the managed replication volume itself or from a view volume that is created from a point in time snapshot and a view volume is represented here as a data volume. Now that we have reviewed some of the core features of Live Volume, let's explore in more detail how Live Volume actually works, starting with a single host and then with multiple hosts. We'll also show how an environment can be configured so that Live Volume will automatically swap Live Volume roles. An automatic role swap occurs based on configurable I.O. thresholds and is different than auto failover, which occurs as the result of a DR event. We'll explain auto swap here and cover auto failover in parts two and three of this video. We'll also explain the difference between uniform and non-uniform server mappings and how this affects the behavior of live volume. Let's start with a very simple scenario with a single host server with a VM workload that is mapped to a data volume on storage center A. The read and write I.O. as shown by the animation is using one or more data paths configured between the host and storage center A. To change the data volume to a live volume, simply use the Dell Storage Manager client to convert the data volume to a live volume. As mentioned previously, this can be done while the workload is active without affecting the host, the VM workload, or I.O. After the live volume is created, the data will replicate to Storage Center B and the volume on Storage Center B will be designated as the secondary live volume in the pair. While the replication takes place, the workload and I.O. all continue uninterrupted. From the perspective of the host server, it still sees only one volume, represented here as an abstracted volume, but now with additional data paths to what the server thinks is the same volume. It is important to understand that only the primary live volume will accept read and write I.O. Any host I.O. that is sent or received on secondary data paths therefore needs to be proxied to the primary live volume on the primary storage center. The host server in this example is configured to use multipath I.O. with two data paths to each storage center, four paths total, with each path set as active optimized. In this configuration, the I.O. workload will be evenly distributed over each of the available primary and secondary paths in a round robin fashion. I.O. over the secondary paths does include a slight latency penalty because the I.O. has to be proxied to the storage center that is hosting the primary live volume as shown here in the animation. This configuration is referred to as uniform access because the host is mapped to both storage centers and can therefore access the live volume through data paths configured 
to both storage centers. Now let's see what happens if we use the Dell Storage Manager client to perform a manual live volume roll swap. I.O. is paused briefly while the roll swap takes place and then I.O. is resumed. Now we can see that the primary data path is to the live volume on storage center B, while the I.O. to storage center A now needs to be proxied to storage center B since storage center A now has a secondary live volume. The MPIO policy continues to utilize all available data paths in a round robin fashion. Now that we have reviewed a simple live volume configuration with one host server, let's introduce a second host server so that we can see how live volume works with multiple hosts in a cluster configuration. To start with, the host server nodes that form a cluster might be located in the same rack, the same data center, or might even be geographically separated by some distance. The design must allow for adequate bandwidth and low enough latency to ensure acceptable performance for the workload, and this becomes increasingly more difficult as the distance increases between the hosts and the storage centers. With two hosts available, as shown here, it is possible to configure the host mappings and live volume so that live volume will automatically swap roles based on I.O. patterns. The settings to enable and configure automatic role swap are found under the properties for each live volume. When swap roles automatically is enabled for a live volume, an administrator can set thresholds that control when an auto role swap takes place, and these include the minimum amount of data going over secondary data paths, and the percent of I.O. that must be using secondary data paths before a role swap is initiated. In addition, administrators can also define a minimum amount of time a primary live volume must spend as primary before another automatic role swap can take place to avoid thrashing the volume back and forth. Now let's take a closer look at how to configure this environment to use automatic role swap. First, we will use non-uniform server mappings. This means that each host is configured to use only the data paths to the storage center that is local to that host instead of each host being mapped to both storage centers. Second, we will limit the VM workload that is generating the majority of the I.O. to the host server that has non-uniform data access to the storage center that is hosting the primary live volume. Now let's introduce some read and write I.O. from the VM workload and note how the I.O. uses the primary data path to the primary live volume hosted by the storage center A. Let's see what happens if we live migrate the VM workload to the other host server. The first thing we notice is that the I.O. follows the workload to the other host and due to the non-uniform mappings, the I.O. must now use secondary data paths and for a short time be proxied to the primary live volume on storage center A. With the I.O. now being proxied through storage center B, the role swap settings now come into play. Once these thresholds are reached, meaning at least one megabyte of data has been proxied, concurrent with over 60% of the I.O. being proxied, then the storage center will automatically perform a role swap as shown here. Once the automatic role swap has completed, the I.O. workload no longer has to be proxied to Storage Center A. Now let's take a look at how this behavior changes if we use uniform server mappings instead of non-uniform mappings. With uniform mappings, each host server is configured with data paths to both storage centers. From the perspective of the host server with the workload, as before, it can access the primary live volume directly, and it can now access the primary live volume indirectly through additional data paths that are proxied through Storage Center B. In this example, we've configured the host servers to use MPIO with Round Robin, which distributes the I.O. evenly over all the available primary and secondary data paths. If permitting I.O. over secondary data paths is not desired, due to low bandwidth or high latency concerns, then either switch to non-uniform server mappings or use a different MPIO policy to control which paths are eligible for I.O. However, 
using an MPIO policy other than round robin can significantly increase administrative overhead and design complexity. The recommendation would be to use round robin for your host server MPIO policy and choose either uniform or non uniform server mappings to determine which live volume data paths are available to your host servers. This will provide the best overall design while minimizing design complexity. For more information about alternate MPIO policies, visit Dell Tech Center and review the Storage Center Synchronous Replication and Live Volume Solutions Guide and also the Microsoft MPIO Best Practices Guide. Now, let's review the live volume settings. With uniform server mappings and round robin, swap roles automatically isn't really a valid configuration any longer. It won't hurt anything to leave this option enabled. Not valid just means that with uniform server mappings, the I.O. pattern will not trigger a failover if the workload moves to the other host because MPIO round robin is sending and receiving I.O. equally over all available primary and secondary data paths. Therefore, the data quantity and percentage thresholds won't be exceeded, which is necessary before an automatic role swap can occur. With uniform mappings, we would typically leave the swap roles automatically option disabled, which is the default, and perform a live volume role swap manually, which we will do in just a moment. First, let's live migrate the VM workload from one host to the other. Once the workload is migrated, the IO will follow. Given this configuration, it might be perfectly acceptable to allow the primary live volume to stay on storage center A if moving the primary live volume to storage center B is desired. For example, if maintenance needs to be done on storage center A, then an administrator can initiate a manual role swap by using the Dell Storage Manager client as shown here. So we'll initiate a role swap manually and note how the data IO to the secondary live volume on storage center A is now proxied to the primary live volume on storage center B. That concludes part one of three of this demo video series. Please continue by viewing part two.